today is probably going to be the messiest day of the semester. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's just the nature of what's going on. In the end, it's not horribly, horribly complicated, but we're kind of putting a piece here together with a piece here together with a piece here. And if I try to do that completely theoretically, you're gonna have no clue what's going on. If we try to do it through a specific example, it's not going to be a good thing to see what's really happening. So we're gonna kind of have to be jumping back and forth between theory and an example, trying to see how one gives us intuition about the other. And that's gonna be, like I said, a big mess. Worse than that though, is that this is going to turn out to be a pretty long process with a lot of steps. A lot of steps with matrices. And the issue is, if you get one thing wrong, you may not be able to tell that you did it wrong until three or four steps later. And then figuring out where you went wrong is horrible. <laughs> I'll be honest, I rarely work through problems before I come to class most of the time. I felt the need to today, and even then, it's like, maybe I wasn't being as careful as I should have been, but I was not getting the right answer. I had to look at it like three or four times before I finally figured out the little stupid mistake that I made. The only way to combat this is to take your time as you go through it. Don't try to skip steps. Be very meticulous in checking yourself as you go through, which is really kind of good advice for all of math, but it's just absolutely essential here. So what are we talking about? Well, we've been working with systems of differential equations and solving them using matrices. But we've been focusing on the homogeneous system of differential equations. So what if we've got a non-homogeneous system? So let's say we have something like x vector prime is equal to 2, negative 1, 3, negative 2, x vector. Now, if it was just that, that would be a homogeneous. So we need there to be something in there to make it non-homogeneous. And we're going to start and try to keep it as simple as possible. Let's just say I've got some extra vector in there of additional stuff. In general, we're going to call this extra vector function thing, we're going to call this capital F of T. So right off the bat, a generic idea of one of these non-homogeneous systems of differential equations is we're going to have x vector prime is equal to some constant matrix A times an x vector plus an f vector of t. We'll come back to that. But like you can probably guess, given everything we've done up to this point, both in systems of differential equations and previously, 
we're not even going to worry about that extra solution vector to begin with. We're going to go ahead and worry about finding the solution to the complementary homogeneous system. And that's what we spent like the last three classes talking about. How do I solve that complementary homogeneous system? Okay, first of all, we're gonna go ahead and take this matrix A and we're gonna find the eigenvalues for it. And how do I find the eigenvalues there? And take the determinant of that. So in this case, we're taking the determinant of 2 minus lambda, negative 1, 3, negative 2 minus lambda, setting that to 0. 2 by 2, so our determinant is down minus up. So 2 minus lambda times negative 2 minus lambda minus a negative 3 equals zero. Multiplying this out, we're going to get lambda squared. We're going to get a negative two lambda plus two lambda will cancel out. Two times negative two is negative four plus three or just Lambda squared minus 1 equals 0. Multiple ways we can solve that, but I'm pretty sure everybody can see that we've got two eigenvalues plus and minus 1. Now that I've got those eigenvalues, now I've got to find the associated eigenvectors. And how do I do that? Yeah, yeah. so what we're saying now is this matrix, not the determinant of it, but this matrix, if I plug in one of the eigenvalues, so let's take the lambda equals one, positive one to begin with. If I plug that in there, I've got, our book uses parentheses, so we've got one, negative one, 3, negative 3, times some vector equals the 0 vector. Pretty obviously, the second line is just a multiple of the first one. So we can just focus on the top one. We get k1 minus k2 equals 0, or k1 equals k2 giving us an eigenvector of any multiple of 1, 1. Do the same thing with the other eigenvalue. If I take the second eigenvalue of negative 1, this is going to become the matrix 3, negative 1, 3, negative 1. So we get 3k1 minus k2 equals 0. 3k1 is equal to k2. And so any multiple of 1, 3 is our eigenvector.
putting that together, what we've got is that our complementary homogeneous solution is any constant times 1, 1 times what? e to the 1 t plus any other constant times the second eigenvector times e to the negative 1 times t or negative t. Before we go further, I'm going to do some stuff with that solution. Just kind of write it some ways that we haven't messed with before. Let's go ahead and let's multiply this stuff into those vectors. So that would give me C1 e to the t, in this case for both components. And over here, I would have C2 e to the negative t, 3 C2 e to the negative t. And the other thing I can do is since I've got a vector plus a vector, we're just adding those components. So we can write this thing as just a single vector. I mean, that's what it is. It is a single vector where we got c1 e to the t plus c2 e to the negative t. Second component is c1 e to the t plus 3 c2 e to the negative t. The fact that we've got mixed constants and functions in there makes this a little bit confusing looking. But what I want to do is kind of, now that I've squashed that all together into a single vector, I want to pull it apart again, but in a different way. I notice that this thing is something times C1 plus something times C2. The second one is also something times C1 and something times C2. Again, all the functions and constants and stuff makes it hard to see, but that's the pattern of a matrix multiplication. I can rewrite this thing as a matrix e to the t, e to the negative t, e to the t, 3 e to the negative t, times a vector c1, c2. Now, this is a little bit backwards from what we often do. We've typically had something like this, where we've had a matrix of constants times a vector of functions. Now I've got a matrix of functions times a vector of constants, which, like I said, seems a little bit backwards to what we've been doing so far, but it's absolutely legitimate to write it that way. We're going to give these things names. Because this is a vector of constants, we're going to be pretty lame and just call this thing C vector. Honestly, we don't care much about that. That's there. Nah, not a big deal. The part that we really care about is this matrix of functions. We're going to call this thing capital Phi of T.
Now let's think about what we know. We know no matter what this vector C is, this thing is our complementary homogeneous solution, right? That means that that always satisfies not the plus FFT part, but the X vector prime equals AX thing, right? Okay. But this, again, is a constant. So while I should do sort of a product rule kind of thing here, derivative of a constant is just going to give me 0. That's going to drop out. So what do I have left at that point? I have, well, OK, so in general, we've got x c prime equals a x c. The x c prime is really just going to be phi prime times c vector equals a phi vector phi c vector. But then, because this has to be true for any constant vector, I can kind of get rid of that part. My phi prime has to equal a phi. OK. I said we were solving these non-homogeneous systems, but I didn't say how we were solving it. Remember when we were solving non-homogeneous systems before, we started with the method of undetermined coefficients, and then we moved on and said, hey, a better way was variation of parameters. It's the same exact thing here. We've done some of these things where we solved them using undetermined coefficients. But for all the same reasons as we came up with variations of parameters before, we want to figure out a way to do that here, a way to use what we've done so far and figure out the particular solution that gives us that 0 for t as an extra part in here. We're trying to figure out a matrix form of variation of parameters. Does anyone remember what was the key thing that got us started with variation of parameters? What was the key assumption that led to everything else? Okay, I mean, that was, I think you're thinking of the superposition principle. And that's absolutely important to what we're doing. But that's not what I would say is the key idea behind variation of parameters. The key idea behind variation of parameters was that, hey, we know any constant linear combination of these functions is going to give us 0. So it must be that to get something other than 0 out of it, it can't be a constant combination of those things. We have to have functions times those things. And it's the same exact thing here, just once again, 
all the matrix stuff kind of makes it a lot more confusing. We know that anything which is this matrix times our, a constant vector is going to be in the complementary homogeneous thing. When I do it, when I do the x vector prime, I'm going to get a times x vector. So the only way I'm going to get this extra 0 for t out of it is if this isn't a constant vector, if this has some kind of function stuff in there. So we're going to assume that our particular solution is that same phi matrix times some u of t. I guess I should say that's a u vector of t. And the whole idea is just that, hey, this is not constant. OK. Well, let's see. What do we have here? This is where we're starting to get all this stuff all over the place and having to try and put all these pieces together. Let's start. Again, this is our differential equation here. This is the thing we're working with. So we're going to need a prime. If this is our xp, what is xp prime? Exactly. Because these are both functions, to take the derivative of it, we're going to need to use a product rule. Derivative of the first part times the second part without the derivative, plus the first part without the derivative times the derivative of the second part. Okay, and then we want to take that and let's plug that into here. Because again, the whole idea is that XP is supposed to be some solution to this, right? Well, over there, I've got both an XP prime and an XP. So the whole idea is that XP prime has to equal a x p plus f of t. I'm going to plug this part in for the x p prime, and I'm going to plug this part in for the x p. So doing that, I've got phi prime. I'm going to drop all the of t's. Just remember that basically everything is a function of t. So we got phi prime u vector. Again, these should be vectors. Phi prime u vector plus phi u vector prime has to equal a xp is phi u vector plus my f. But now one more substitution. We said from here, phi prime was a times phi. So let's take that and plug that in there. So we've got a phi u vector plus phi u vector prime equals a 
phi u vector plus f vector. But now we finally hit pay dirt. What do you see? Yeah, both sides have an a phi u vector. And with canceling those things out, notice, okay, and again, easy to get lost when we've got all these things in here. We're assuming that our particular solution is phi times u, right? We know what phi is, we've got that. So if we can figure out what u is, we've got our particular solution. And with canceling out those terms, okay, we don't have u in there, but we got a u prime. Last thing, how can I get that u prime by itself? Okay, right idea, but wrong in specifics because I can't just divide by phi because phi is a matrix. But you got the right idea. What we want to do is cancel out that phi. Is there anyone in here who's had linear algebra? Huh. Okay. What we need is instead of dividing by phi, we need to do what it's kind of the equivalent for a matrix, which is multiplying by the inverse. We can say u prime is phi inverse times f. But now the question is, how do we find the inverse of a matrix? It involves some determinant stuff. But let's, let's back up. Okay, I don't want to erase that. Erase. This is my phi of t. We'll come back to the phi and its inverse in a second. But first of all, just how do we find the inverse of a two by two matrix. Let me start by saying that in general, finding inverses of matrix is a hard problem. We can do it for two by twos really, really simply. And for this class, that's all we're gonna worry about is two by twos. It's not too bad by hand to do them for three by three matrices. A little bit of effort, don't get me wrong, but nothing you can't do with a little bit of time and effort. It very, very rapidly gets very, very hard to get bigger than that. Sure, computers can do four by fours, five by fives, six by sixes, no problem. But honestly, even computers slow down really, really quickly once you start getting too big. And too big is not nearly as big as you might think. <laughs> uh, I haven't kept up on exactly how good computers are at finding inverses, but I would be surprised if they could find the inverse of a 20 by 20 efficiently. I think that's the kind of thing that's probably going to take days of computation time on a really fast computer. 
again, I haven't kept up on it. I could be way off in my estimates, but the fact is it gets hard really quickly. But for us, especially when we're talking about matrices of functions like this, we're going to stick to just two by twos. So I'm going to just do a number one first. Give me some numbers. Two, seven, negative one, three. Okay. There's sort of three things that we do to find the inverse of this. Step one, the main diagonal, those two things, I'm going to flip their places. So I'm going to put a three up here and a two down there. The other two numbers, the off diagonal, I'm going to change their signs, but keep them in the same place. So this is going to become a negative 7 up there and a positive 1 there. Now, there's a third thing i got to do. But before I do that, let's actually just see what happens with this. Let's see what happens if I multiply these two matrices together. What happens if I take the 2, 7, negative 1, 3 times the 3, negative 7, 1, 2. So we know we go across and down, multiplying and adding. So that gives us 6 plus 7 is 13 there. Negative 14 plus 14 is 0 for the top right. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0 for the bottom left. 7 plus 6 is 13 for the bottom right. That's not what we want. But it's close. What do you think we do want anyway? Don't want it to be zero, definitely not. Okay, remember that we're thinking about this as being like dividing, being like a reciprocal. When you multiply two things that are reciprocals, what do you get? One. And what is it in terms of matrices that you multiply by that's like multiplying by one? The identity, the identity matrix. So what we really want is to figure out what is it that I multiply times the original matrix to get the identity matrix? And this is close. I mean, it's got the zeros in the right places. It's got these being the same, but it's 13 there instead of 1. So what can I do to make those things 1s? Divide it by 13, or basically multiply this matrix by 1 13th. But that brings up the question, what's the importance of 13 here? And as a hint, you used the word a few minutes ago. Not the eigenvalues. It's the determinant of this matrix. Down is 6, minus a negative 7 is 13. So the final third step is we multiply by 1 over the determinant of the matrix. So three parts to finding the, the inverse for a 2 by 2. We're swapping the places on the main diagonal.
We're changing the signs of the off diagonal and then multiplying by one over the determinant of the matrix. Okay. I'm not gonna go ahead and check that that actually works because we basically have it here. If I were to make each of these things be over 13, I would still get my zeros. These would become 13s over 13s. Those would give me my ones. I'd have my identity matrix. Okay, so with that three-step process in mind, let's figure out what's the inverse of this phi matrix. Okay, so phi inverse is one over, what's the determinant? Okay, so to figure out the determinant, we do down minus up. But this is really nice because when I multiply down, e to the t times e to the negative t is 1. So I get 3 minus 1 is just 2. Then, same stuff as before, I'm swapping the places on the main diagonal. So I've got 3 e to the negative t up here. I've got e to the t there. The other two stay in the same spot, but I change the signs. So I've got minus e to the minus t and minus e to the t. I'm going to go ahead and distribute that one half through there. Eh, do I want to? Eh. There's a case for just leaving the one half on the outside, but I'm going to go ahead and multiply it through. Okay, back to what we're trying to do now. We're trying to figure out u vector prime. Now, really we want u vector, but u vector prime is gonna be our, a big step toward doing it. So that has to equal this inverse matrix that we just found, this thing times F. And it's not on the board anymore. What was F? That was that extra vector, the 0, 4, T. So U vector prime has to equal V inverse times F. It's this matrix here. Times zero for T. Across, down, zero, this times this, 
is going to be negative 2t e to the negative t. Bottom, across, down. Again, 0 doesn't really matter. I'm going to have this times this is a positive 2t e to the positive t. We are both almost there and still have some annoying math to do to get there. That's u vector prime. What do I have to do to get u vector? Integrate it. What do I have to do to integrate it? Sorry, what was that? Kind of, sort of. So let me first of all just make it easy. So to integrate, we have to, all we have to do is integrate each component separately. Yeah, so it's that simple. But what do I have to do to integrate each component separately? Integration by parts, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to do some integration by parts. We're going to have to do the integral of, to start with, negative 2t e to the negative t dt. Like you said, even if you don't remember the name integration by parts, you remembered it's the UV stuff. So what do you think should be U? What do you think should be DV? And I'm going to stick the DT on the DV as well. OK, so then DU. Well, derivative of that is just negative 2 dt. And when I integrate e to the negative t dt, v is negative e to the negative t. Integration by parts says that this thing has to equal uv minus the integral of v du. So u times v, negative times a negative, will give me a positive 2t e to the negative t. Minus the integral of v du, that's minus, two minuses multiplied together is going to end up still being negative. Two e to the negative t dt. But then we integrate that, we get another negative in there. And so we end up with 2t e to the negative t plus 2e to the negative t. We would repeat that process for the second one. It's even easier because there's fewer negatives floating around. Same basic process. And we end up with then that our u vector is what we just got there for the first component. And then for the second component, we get 2t e to the t minus 2 e to the t. Once again, 
when we got all these steps and all these things and we're figuring it out, it's really easy to lose track of what we're trying to do. Why did I want that you? <laughs> it's fee, yeah. Yeah, our particular solution is fee, not fee inverse, fee times that matrix or times that vector we just found. We've got all the pieces. We've got our original fee right here, and we've got our U right here. So finally, our particular solution is E to the T, E to the negative T, E to the T, 3 e to the negative t times this vector, 2t e to the negative t plus 2e to the negative t, 2t e to the positive t minus 2e to the positive t. It's worth noting that when I was working on this problem earlier, everything that we just did, I did it all that fine. And then this step of multiplying this out is where I screwed up. <laughs> okay, we're going across and down. This whole top thing, all two things there, is being multiplied by just e to the t. What happens when I multiply that top thing by e to the t? Yeah, the e to the t times e to the minus t is 1, so I just have 2t plus 2. Plus e to the minus t times the bottom. Well, same kind of thing. I've got e to the minus t times e to the t. Those become 1, and I'm left with plus 2t minus 2. All that's just the first component. So my second component, I do the same thing with the bottom row. Well, first part's exactly the same. e to the t times that's going to give me 2t plus 2. Sorry, what's that? Up here? Mm -hmm. There's a minus there. We get another negative from the integration, so it turns it positive. Wait, so. Okay, so this is u times v, u, negative times a negative is a positive, minus v du. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, back to where we were. We're taking this times this, and what do I get? The 3e to the minus t times this. Okay, so putting that all together, the plus two minus two cancels out, and I get 4t for the top. 2t plus 6t is 8t minus four. And that is our particular solution, but after almost 50 minutes of working trying to get there, there is no way I would want to leave it there without checking it. So how can I check that? Well, remember, 
this all came back to this differential equation. It all came back to that we were trying to find a solution to x vector prime equals the original matrix was 2, negative 1, 3, negative 2 times x vector plus my f was the 0, 4, t. If we have done this right, then this particular solution, we plug it in for our x there, and both sides should be equal. Let's start with the easy one. What is xp prime? Just a nice constant vector for 8. On the other side, we have to figure out what is 2, negative 1, 3, negative 2 times our xp vector, 4t, 8t minus 4, plus 0, 4t. Across, down, as usual, 2 times 4t, that's easy. Negative 1 times the second part is going to give us a negative 8t plus 4. Across and down for the bottom row, 3 times 4t is 12t minus 16t plus 8. And we get a plus 0 and plus 4t from our other vector. OK, 8t minus 8t cancels, gives me 4 for the top. 12t minus 16t plus 4t cancels out, leaves me with the 8. There we go. Layla? OK, we're just taking the derivative here. Yeah, this is our xp, and this is we're taking the derivative of it. So <laughs> I, I told you at the beginning this was going to be messy. There's, you know, there's so many things going together here. OK, but we've done it. <laughs> we now know that finally, after all that stuff, I'm not going to even bother putting it together. At this point, if you don't know how to take your particular solution plus your complementary homogeneous solution, give up. <laughs> OK. Now, here's the thing. There is nothing I can do to make this long process easy. There's a lot of steps. We've got to go through everything we just did one way or another. However. we can kind of take everything we did and actually, even if the computations are going to be tough, we can take the whole process and put it down into a fairly simple formula. If we go through everything we did, it really all comes down to that our particular solution is our phi matrix times the integral of phi inverse times that f vector dt. Like I said, there's a lot going on there. But everything we did is all encapsulated in that one fairly simple looking formula.
So first one took us roughly 50 minutes. We'll see if we can get another one done in 18 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so Make sure we're on the state right place getting started. What is this matrix called? That's just our A. This? Okay. Now we are gonna need that F of T obviously later on, but before I can do anything else, I need to solve the complementary homogeneous. Which unfortunately is not trivial. We know our basic idea. We're going to take the determinant of A minus lambda I, take the determinant, set it equal to zero. That's going to give us two minus lambda squared plus four equals zero. That's going to mean that two minus lambda squared is a negative four. That means that two minus lambda is plus or minus two i. Lambda is equal to two plus or minus two i. Uh, sorry, negative, no, two plus or minus two i. Okay, so we've got a complex eigenvalue. What do I do with that complex eigenvalue? Yeah, so we're really going to use the complex eigenvector exactly the same as we would use a real valued eigenvalue. We're going to, no matter what, we're going to use that eigenvalue to find the eigenvector. The only thing is, is that since this is a complex number, we're going to start by finding a complex valued eigenvector. Now, to make it just a little bit easier, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, we can use either eigenvalue here. We've got two plus or minus two i. We can either use two plus two i or two minus two i. Because of the way this is all set up, it's actually going to be slightly easier to use two minus two i. So if I take lambda is two minus two i, my A minus lambda I matrix becomes two I negative one for two I. As I mentioned a few times last time, that second row may not look like just a constant multiple of the first row, but it is. So I can just say, look, this means that two I K one minus K two equals zero. <laughs> two I K one equals K two. And so I can just say one two I is my nice eigen vector. <laughs> Now, 
Now's where we had those big complicated formulas for dealing with complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So before I pull those formulas out, what is alpha, what is beta? What is B1 and what is B2? Remember that B1 is the coefficients of the real numbers, so 1 and 0. B2 is the coefficients of i, so 0 and 2. And then, as ugly as that is, as ugly as the formulas are, all we're doing is plugging in that alpha, beta, B1, and B2 into those big, ugly formulas. And again, I don't have those formulas memorized. Now again, this is just our complementary homogeneous. So we're getting C1 times this thing. B1 is one zero, cosine of beta is negative two T minus zero two sine of negative 2t e to the 2t plus c2 times the 0 2 cosine of negative 2t plus 1 0 sine negative 2t e to the 2t. Couple of things to remember here. Sine of negative 2t. Remember what I can do with a negative sign there? Yeah, sine is an odd function, so I can bring the negative sign out. So that can actually just go ahead and make that a positive there. And over here, make that a negative. What about for the cosine? What can I do with the negative? Just can go take, get rid of it completely. Because cosine is an even function. Cosine of the negative is equal to the cosine of the positive. OK, so putting all this together then, squashing everything we have, we get that this is equal to C1 times cosine 2t e to the 2t. minus C2 sine 2t e to the 2t. Second component, I've got a 
2 c1 sine 2t e to the 2t. Da, da, da. Plus 2 c2 cosine 2t two e to the 2t. Two And again, what I'm really doing is I'm rewriting that thing as a two by two matrix times the constant vector C1, C2. This thing here is now my phi. Looking at our formula here, what's the next thing I got to figure out? I've got to figure out what's the inverse of phi. So I swap my main diagonal. I'm going to have 2 e to the 2t cosine 2t up here. I'm going to have e to the 2t cosine 2t down here. The other two entries stay in the same place, but change signs. So I'm going to have e to the 2t, sine 2t on the top row, and a negative 2 e to the 2t, sine 2t down here. But the last thing I've got to do is multiply by 1 over the determinant. And at first glance, the determinant looks like a big bloody mess. But it's not as bad as it looks. To get my determinant, I do down minus up, right? Well, if I multiply down, I'm going to get 2 e to the 2t times e to the 2t, e to the 4t, cosine 2t times cosine 2t, minus, multiply up. <clears throat> but when I multiply up, I get another minus. So that'll become a plus 2 e to the 2t times e to the 2t sine 2t times sine 2t still looks like a mess but i think somebody has saw what to do now yeah so if i factor out a 2e to the 4t i've got cosine squared 2t plus sine squared 2t left over and this is just 1. So my whole determinant is just 2e to the 4t. And so